The Big Three of Vertigo, an initial approach to the undifferentiated vertigo patient by me, Peter Johns. I am an emergency physician practicing at the Ottawa Hospital in Ottawa, Canada. This video is meant to be a brief review which can be accessed at the point of care. The purpose of the Big Three approach is to lead the clinician who is not a vertigo expert as straightforwardly as possible to the Big Three diagnoses, which are BPBV, vestibular neuritis, and cerebellar brainstem stroke syndromes. Why these three? Well, BPBV is the most common and curable cause of vertigo, yet it is still underdiagnosed and undertreated. Cerebellar brainstem stroke syndromes are the most common of the dangerous cause of vertigo and much feared because it's sometimes hard to distinguish them from a more common non-dangerous cause, which is vestibular neuritis. Luckily, there is evidence-based bedside testing which will allow you to confirm the diagnosis of BPVV or vestibular neuritis and thus rule out cerebellar stroke. The Big 3 approach describes the cardinal features of the Big 3 diagnoses and outlines which bedside testing to perform on which patient and how to interpret the results. Of course, it doesn't show you how to diagnose all causes of vertigo, but most of the other vestibular causes of vertigo are rare and not time sensitive for diagnosis. In the emergency department and primary care settings, BPBV, vestibular neuritis, and cerebellar stroke syndromes are the diagnoses you really need to be able to make in order to consider yourself vertigo competent. Nor will it help you determine if there are medical causes for your patient's dizziness, but patients with serious general medical causes of dizziness will have other features in their presentation which will suggest that you are not dealing with isolated vertigo. Here's a table reproduced with permission from the ninth edition of Tintinelli's textbook of emergency medicine. It has BPBV, vestibular neuritis, and cerebellar stroke across the top and outlines the salient features of each condition as well as which bedside testing to perform and how to interpret them. This flowchart, also from Tintinelli, leads you through the initial approach to diagnosing acute vertigo. The rest of this video will explain how to use this flowchart. The first thing to do is to use the central part of the flowchart to screen for central features of vertigo. These are features that are rarely, if ever seen in BPBV or vestibular neuritis, but can be seen in cerebellar brainstem stroke syndromes. So ask about and look for any typical stroke symptoms, such as focal weakness or sensory changes, but also the more subtle posterior circulation symptoms, the so-called deadly Ds, dysarthria, diplopia, dysphagia, dysmetria, dysphonia. If a patient had neurologic symptoms and vertigo, but they have now resolved, this would make you concerned about a posterior circulation TIA. Also, if the patient has spontaneous vertical nystagmus, this is indicative of a central cause for their vertigo. Now remember, this does not include nystagmus seen in BPVV, which often has a very prominent vertical component. Also, a sustained significant headache would make one concerned about a cerebellar hemorrhage, and a sustained significant neck pain would be concerning for vertebral artery dissection. Lastly, patients with vestibular neuritis may be hesitant to stand and walk, but with encouragement should be able to do so. Inability to stand and walk is very concerning for a cerebellar stroke. If your patient screens positive for any of these features, you should go on to diagnostic imaging and referral to specialist care. The next section, highlighted on the left, deals with patients who likely have BPBV. These patients have short episodes of vertigo, often around 20 or 30 seconds in duration, but sometimes up to two minutes. The vertigo may be described as spinning, but also sometimes is described as lightheadedness especially by elderly patients in whom the condition is most common. The key distinction is that it's initiated by head movements, such as lying down or getting out of bed or rolling over in bed. When they remain still, the intense vertigo goes away. This is a major distinct distinction when compared to vestibular neuritis or cerebellar stroke, where the patient has significant ongoing vertigo, which is briefly worsened by head movement. Patients with BPBV have no ongoing significant vertigo when they are at rest, but may still complain of being slightly dizzy or off balance even when they are not suffering from an acute 30 second episode of vertigo. Importantly, when you examine them after they've been upright for a while, 
and you have them look straight ahead and then off to the sides, you will not see nystagmus. The diagnostic testing to perform initially is the Dix-Hallpike test. Do not perform Hints Plus testing on these patients, as Hints Plus testing is reserved for patients who have hours or days of ongoing continuous vertigo and have spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus. Now I'll show a typical positive Dix Hall Pike when testing the left ear. You will see when the woman gets in the left ear down position, there's a few seconds of latency where she doesn't have vertigo or nystagmus. Then she develops a crescendo decrescendo pattern of nystagmus which lasts about 12 seconds. The nystagmus scene is vertical upward with a rotatory component towards the left downward affected ear. If your patient has been screened negative for the central features as in the central part of the flowchart and exhibits a dix hall pike test such as this, you can be assured that they are suffering from posterior canal BPBV and can likely be cured in about three minutes by the Epley Maneuver. For more on BPBV and the Epley Maneuver, click on the link on the screen. Now what if you perform the dix hall pike test on someone who sounds like they have BPBV, but the patient doesn't get nystagmus or vertigo? Or instead of the rotatory and vertical upward nystagmus I just showed you, instead you see this. This is not vertical upward or rotatory nystagmus, and this is not a positive dix hall pike test. This is horizontal nystagmus and means the patient is likely suffering from horizontal canal BPBV. Horizontal canal BPBV is seen in up to one third of patients with BPBV and is diagnosed with another test called the supine roll test. It's important for clinicians to recognize this common variation of BPBV in order to avoid over investigation of horizontal canal BPBV and avoid applying the Epley maneuver to these patients because it doesn't work for them. My preferred method of treating these patients is with the Gafani maneuver. There's a link to a video I made which explains how to diagnose and treat horizontal canal BPBV. Now that you have used the central part of the flow chart to screen for central vertigo and used the left hand part to diagnose those with short episodes of positional vertigo which are mostly BPBV, that leaves us with a smaller group of patients who are suffering from many hours or days of continuous ongoing vertigo. Their vertigo is worsened by head movements as compared to initiated by head movements and BPBV and you observe spontaneous nystagmus either while they're looking straight ahead or when they look off to the side. The majority of these patients will have vestibular neuritis, but some will be suffering from a cerebellar stroke. This is where you use the Hints Plus testing to confirm that they have vestibular neuritis so they can be safely discharged without diagnostic imaging. dix hall pike testing should not be performed on patients who have spontaneous nystagmus as they will not be suffering from BPBV. There are four components to the Hints Plus exam. Nystagmus, test of skew, the head impulse test, and the plus part of Hints Plus, which is a bedside test of hearing. Each component has either a central or peripheral result. If any of the four components have a central result, then the overall Hints Plus exam is described as Hints Plus Central, and this indicates a stroke or, less commonly, other central pathology. In order to reach an overall Hints Plus peripheral result, all four components must have a peripheral result. Then you can safely discharge the patient with a diagnosis of vestibular neuritis. Here is an example of unidirectional nystagmus where the fast component of the nystagmus is to the patient's left and then increases when he looks left and decreases when he looks to the right. But importantly, the nystagmus is still in the left direction. This is a Hints Plus peripheral result. In bidirectional nystagmus, such as in this woman, the fast component is to the right when she looks to the right and then changes to the left when she gazes to the left. Although not often seen, if it is observed, it can only be caused by a central condition, and it's a Hints Plus central result. This woman has no vertical or diagonal skew of her eyes when tested, and this is a Hints Plus peripheral result. This man has diagonal movement of his eyes and this is an abnormal skew deviation and is a Hints Plus central result. This is an abnormal head impulse test when the head is turned to the right. This is a counterintuitive finding because although it is abnormal, it is a Hints Plus peripheral result. 
This woman, who had bidirectional nystagmus, has a normal head and pulse test. Again, counterintuitive, because in patients with ongoing vertigo and nystagmus, a normal head and pulse test is a hints plus central result and very concerning that the patient is suffering from a stroke. Lastly, if a patient is suffering from a new hearing loss, as determined by the finger rub test, then this is a hints plus central result and concerning for an ICA stroke, an anterior inferior cerebellar artery stroke. In this type of cerebellar stroke, the patient suffers from an ischemic infarct of their cerebellum and labyrinth, so develops a, an acute hearing loss occurring at the same time as the vertigo. They may also have an abnormal head impulse test, so the bedside test of hearing is important to pick up an ICA stroke. So again, if any of the four components shows a HINTS plus central result, the overall HINTS plus exam is a central result, and you need to further evaluate and treat these patients. The only way to safely discharge a patient with a diagnosis of vestibular neuritis if, is if all four components of the HINTS plus exam show a peripheral result. For more information, click here to go to my video with more detail on performing and interpreting the HINTS plus exam. A last question about performing bedside testing on a patient with vertigo. In what circumstances would you perform the dix Hallpike test and the HINTS plus exam on the same patient? Well, you should only perform the dix Hallpike test on patients with episodes of vertigo lasting less than two minutes and you observe no spontaneous nystagmus. And you should only perform the HINTS plus exam on patients with many hours or days of ongoing vertigo and spontaneous nystagmus. So the answer is never. So this is my review of the big three of vertigo. I have a lot of other videos on my YouTube channel. I try and answer questions and comments as much as I can, so feel free to post them. Keep in mind though that this video is aimed at medical professionals who are using this information to assess their patients. Thanks for watching.